Hello everyone, my name is Bill Rand. I am the director of the Center for Complexity and Business at the University of Maryland, as well as a professor of marketing and computer science at the University of Maryland. And I was also one of Professor Holland's last students. Um, I'm very sorry I can't make it out to be with you all today, but in fact, in many ways, that's uh, due to Professor Holland. Uh, I uh, took to heart some of the things that Professor Holland said about science and communication. Uh, he's said a lot of things over the years uh, that have been very important in my life. Uh, you know, and one of the quotes that's up on the SFI page, for instance, right now, uh, which is, that I, I really believe in, which is, I, he once said, I and many times said this, I have more ideas than I can ever follow up in a lifetime, so I never worry if someone steals an idea from me. And Professor Allen really believed in openness and communication, and in fact, he told me several times that, you know, you're not really doing science unless you can explain that science to someone else. And that um, slogan or motto is kind of something that I really try to live my life by. And as a result, when I had the opportunity to come to the University of Maryland and create a Center for Complexity in Business, I thought that would be a great opportunity to kind of really reach out to the business and the practitioner community and show them how to apply complex systems theory and complexity science to their day-to-day -day lives. And so right now I'm not with you because I actually am at a meeting in Seattle trying to uh, garner additional support from a number of companies uh, who are interested in complex system science. But I did want to tell one quick story about Professor Hahn. I think it kind of builds upon this notion about him being a great communicator uh, of science and, and a really great explainer of science as a whole. Um, there's actually a chapter in my dissertation uh, that is very, uh, has never been published except in my dissertation and is very important to me uh, because it was something that Professor Holland uh, requested, demanded that I put in there. Um, he was the chair, a co-chair on my committee. Um, and so I, I actually pulled it out. I have it sitting to one side here, my big dissertation book, which, um, uh, and so now I'm going to read it verbatim. Just, just kidding. I'm not going to read the chapter. Uh, but I wanted to tell you the story. So the story um, is called The Story of a Schema. And it's actually titled that way in the book. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that you don't normally think of stories as being uh, terribly scientific or very um, rigorous, right? Uh, but in this case, it was a great way to explain a number of complex phenomena to people. And so Professor Helen um, suggested that I put it into the dissertation. It's still there to this day, and it's one of the best things I've ever written that no one knows about. Um, and so uh, I wanted to describe to you basically what that story is. So for those of you who don't know what a schema is, it's a form of a building block uh, that contributes to the overall uh, quality of a solution that you're trying to solve. You might think of it as solving a sub-problem of a larger problem. Um, and within genetic algorithms, which uh, Professor Holland uh, created, schema are often considered to be distributed throughout a population. In other words, different individuals can solve some problems differently than other individuals, right? So some people know how to cook, other people know how to grow, other people know how to grow food, for instance, right? And so they have different schemas that represent those abilities. Uh, and by putting a set of genetic operators over time, individuals combine different schema to solve a problem that none of the individual schema can solve on their own. So a farmer can eventually learn to cook their own meal, right, by combining these two different schemas within the overall system. Often there are multiple copies of the same schema present, right? So maybe many people know how to cook and maybe many people know how to farm, right? And it's just a matter of getting those individuals together to create that farmer cook. And one of the remarkable things about a piece of work that Professor Holland did known as the schema theorem is that it explained how these schema can accumulate to solve a much larger problem than any of the individual schema can solve on their own. So if, Given that little bit of background, let me get back to my dissertation. In one of the experiments in my dissertation, we found a, a particular schema, schema number three, we called it, that went from one copy of itself within the population to five copies in one generation. Uh, and that was uh, seemed like an unlikely event. And I showed these results to Professor Holland, and he said, well, you should go and figure out how did that actually happen? How did you have this one schema that created five copies of itself, especially when it's the actual overall problem is solving wasn't that useful. 
Um, so I went back, I built a whole new set of code to kind of allow me to trace all these interactions that the individuals were having in the system. And what I found out is that schema th three was a particularly lucky schema, but not outside the realm of believability. Uh, first of all, it had a relatively low fitness compared to some of the other schema. In other words, the problem it was trying to solve was not as uh, hard or as difficult a problem to solve as some of the others, and it didn't solve it terribly well. But it managed to compete against a bunch of other schema uh, who were even worse off than it was. Um, in other words, it didn't solve a very important problem, but compared to other schema, its problem was more important. And as a result, in one generation, it was selected seven different times to participate in the evolutionary process. Uh, given its fitness and all, this wasn't terrible, wasn't, it wasn't likely, uh, but I did the math out and I figured out that it should have happened about two times out of every hundred times that you tried this particular result. So, you know, it had about a 2% probability of occurring. In this particular case, we saw it actually happen. Moreover, what was interesting is the way it was then evolved into the next generation, it happened in a number of different methods. It was created by both cloning, which is an operator within genetic elements where you literally take a schema or an individual and you copy it to the next uh, generation, and crossover, which is one where you take two different individuals, cross over their solutions, and create a new individual as a result. Uh, it turned out Schema 3 was actually cloned three times into the next generation. Um, and two additional times it was involved in a crossover operation that did not create a new version of it. Um, and two, but two additional times it was involved in crossover which did create a version of it. One of those times was a very simple time to understand. It basically, the, the crossover point was outside the actual sub-solution and so as a result um, you are guaranteed to get one copy propagating to the next generation. But another time, it actually was well within that. And so you would expect that this would actually destroy that copy of the schema. But it turned out that one of the other individuals it was combining with happened to have the couple of bits that were outside of the crossover point exactly set in the right way. And so as a result, even though it was briefly destroyed when it was recombined, it was recreated when it was combined back with the other individual. So, you know, this is just an example of taking something that seems boring and dry and abstract, like the schema theorem, and showing how you can actually tell a story about how that schema theorem comes to apply to something like the actual computer science of generating solutions to better, harder and harder, more difficult problems. Um, you know, this entire narrative is described in much more detail in my dissertation, so if you want to look at it, it's there. But what I love about this narrative is that it's not a scientific narrative, right? And it's not based on averages or proofs. There's lots of calculations I did just to kind of back up some of the results. But nonetheless, it's still a compelling story about how evolution finds a way. And I think it can help people understand how something as abstract as the schema theorem actually works. Um, it was Professor Holland that demanded that this be part of my dissertation, and I'm happy every day that he did that. Uh, and I believe that this is just one example, one small example, as to why Professor Holland clearly thought that doing science was uh, as important or almost as important as communicating science. Since it's only when we communicate science to others that we have truly contributed to society. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I hope the, 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 the meeting and the presentations go wonderfully well.